So we really wanted to start to figure out how to transform ourselves. And our journey has been going on for quite some time. The most relevant and most successful points is when we started our Agile uh, transformation. But we learned over the course of moving through waterfall, we had to move away from that because our, we couldn't deal with the three-year development cycles. The other thing that waterfall was doing to us is that if six months before we were shipping, we were doing our beta testing, and we'd get great requirements and feedback from our customers, but we have to tell them we can't incorporate this in current release. So we put it in the next release, and for all practical purposes, customers were not getting new features for almost six years. We had to move away from it. And in the 90s, we really wanted to go to iterations. And we were being successful with the iterations, but we still had a waterfall mentality, being that six months before we were getting ready to ship, we get feedback. And we'd also we tell the customer again, we can't incorporate it to this release. We were not getting uh, feedback with every iteration. We were still getting that the end of the release. So we were not satisfying our customers' needs. When Apple came along, that really gave us the opportunity to get feedback and have more transparency throughout the release cycle. So we were getting to our quality certification checkpoints um, six weeks before we ship and figuring out what our known state was. We, we had the transparency along the way, so we were able to address our technical debt. We were able to address uh, customer needs in the release, and we were building things that were higher quality, faster time to market. So we started to see that, and that's when, you know, in small pockets, we said we need to do something more globally and more larger scale. So we came up with three principles which um, we tied to this transformation. Agile to deal with the uncertainty, the market dynamics, the, you know, the, team, the team dynamics, and so forth. Being able to be responsive. One concern we had for my sponsors had at the uh, senior executive level was this agile is not discipline. I had to prove to them it was discipline. I said, well, look, agile allows us to deal with the uncertainty. We will put process in place to deal with the complexities. The complexities being, you know, what are the business controls that we deal with? What do we do with um, outsourcing? What are we doing with the geographically dispersed team? So we, we coupled, we married the two to make sure that we had this discipline in place. The last thing we did was really to focus on we create best, a set of best practices. Let's see if we can put tools around those best practices to accelerate or enhance and encourage uh, the adoption of the best practices. And so that was another mantra that came about is that we always wanted to tie tooling to the best practices. So our agile journey really started at Ernest in 2006. So you know it takes a little time to move this ship in the right direction. And it actually in 2006 was, six was not very successful. We had small pockets of experts, but they had a hard time encouraging their teams to take risks to try agile out. So I came in in 2007 and I said, okay, I'll, I'll get the sponsorship. I'll give you the right back. So we started to figure out how to make this really happen. So our approach was basically threefold. And you'll see a lot of threes from me. Educate, enable, and empower the teams. So create the materials, teach the materials, enable the teams to be successful with the tool and their own best practices, and then have them empower themselves to continue to self-sustain their adoption. And that could be with more air cover, be more uh, education, just helping them through their hurdles. So the way this started to get really uh, to scale at IBM or within software group is that we really got a lot of excitement at the grassroots level. And I saw that because now we're starting to train the team, we started to feel really excited about it, and it, it really started to create a demand for more education and for more teams to start to pick this up. But they came to me and said, I'm too scared. I don't want to talk to my exec about this because he has a certain way of doing things. He's not going to support this. He's going to shut it down. And so I promised to them as a transformation exec that I would go to them and say, look, here's some success stories. Please, I need your support. I need your encouragement to let these people try. 
I'll provide the safety net. We won't put a lot, we won't introduce more risk into the system. And then by having these few success stories and taking them back to the senior execs and their teams talking about their success and the fact that they like this really got the bottoms up, bottoms up and the tops down support for us to really start to transform the 26,000 individuals. So over the course of 18 months, we've held, based on this workshop material that we put together with Mary and Tom Poppenby, we've educated trainers. Now we've held over 230 uh, workshops and trained over 7,000 people in the uh, course of 18 months. And now with our surveys that we do yearly, we uh, have 70% of the project teams within software, and we have about 500 teams using one or more best practices. So now we're starting to see that, that we're starting to sustain it because of grassroots movement and collateral behind it, and that the uh, uh, user stories uh, and, and case studies have really supported um, the success of, of the team. So that's been great. Now to sustain it, I also looked at you know, uh, creating a center of competency. And what I really wanted to come, have come out of this, when I think about transformation, I think about how do I measure success, is that I first started with a push model, but I really thought this would be uh, successful and self-sustaining, I had to create um, the pull. And so we started to see the pull come in and, and request for coaches to come out and to scale this and uh, be part of their teams and to scale it out to the larger portions of the divisions. And so we started to see that moment occur in the uh, mid to late 2008 time frame. So we started to see that this is really going to sustain itself. The other thing that I wanted to make sure would not happen is, is the bottom of the work there. Too often uh, people are afraid of, especially when you come from headquarters and I'm here to help, is that we're going to mandate change. People just shy away from anything that's mandated. So I just lost it. So what we, um, what I always tell my team is like, know when to mandate change or to measure it or to motivate. With the agile movement, it was all about motivating and inspiring teams to change. I did not want to go in and mandate because I knew people would just be turned off by that. Because no one likes to be told what to do. And so that was the other element that I think made our transition and transformation story start to stick is really going from on the motivation side. Now we're working back to, okay, how do we measure it? How do we continue to sustain this? So that's the model that we kind of use uh, so far. So now that I've been in business for a couple of years and started to see some success, finance is asking me, my CFO is asking me, okay, show me some business results. Show me how this is really working. And I have to come up with a set of metrics, obviously, because they're not just going to let me uh, go and do this without being measured. So we wanted to come up with some core lines that were business value to them, um, and also had value to just understanding our work. So we looked at the productivity, the quality of our products, where the quality of the release was getting better, re release after release. We were looking at where we were satisfying more of our stakeholders' uh, feedback and, and incorporating current release, and we were just looking at overall cost of development. And those were just the basic starting points that um, I wanted to start to measure across the portfolio. I also established a framework called E Square, which is really effectiveness plus efficiencies. Efficiencies can be gained by the lean elements and you know, eliminating waste. Effectiveness was really measuring are you providing enough business value? And I wanted to measure both because you can be efficient but not, might not build the right product. So I wanted two dimensions uh, to really look at how to increase the revenue and profitability of of um, software. So we put this uh, framework in together and we started measuring it. Now you can see here uh, we did some trend analysis and really what this is saying is that the team sizes have gone down. And what we've done is we haven't eliminated those people, we've reinvested them. And what you'll see with the, the dotted lines is that we've actually are building and shipping more products per year. And that again to the business we're just showing how we're reinvesting and putting uh, you know, our product uh, shipments and putting more out um, uh, per year. The other thing is that our team size um, has decreased. And what we did is we reinvested those 
resources into building uh, new enterprise or going after white space. So our average team size, I would say, uh, seven years ago was in the 500 to 600 range. We're now in the 50 range. So we've really dramatically uh, reduced team size, and that helps reduce uh, complexity and risk and so forth. And so that has really allowed us to come into new uh, white space opportunities. And we also measure um, bottom line growth. So we're looking at headcount, uh, revenue per headcount. And that's something that just the finance guys might have been sharing the links uh, to see. So we're showing that there's uh, been a, a positive trend of you know, revenue dollars per headcount. So that's uh, kind of the core metrics that I actually give back to the, to the business to show how, how things are improving and we're being more effective. This has been going on, as, as I said, for about um, 18 months now. So it's really this agile is helping us. So we started to see other things start to emerge that we had to address. The key one is that leadership roles evolve with the agile adoption. I had so many people coming to me saying, the gearbox is working, but the project manager didn't know how to, what their role was. The first line manager or the, the, the director of development said, well, what role am I playing now in this? How do I facilitate and help my teams? Because they seem to be self-organizing, they seem to be handling a lot of stuff. What, 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 what is my role now? The other thing that we learned along the way, and I think everyone experiences this, especially in this economic challenge uh, downturn, is that we're dealing with more constraints, we have less flexibility, but we're still told to innovate still told to hold to our development schedules. So with the, the evolution or the changing of the leadership roles and the fact that we have more constraints, I really wanted to start to say, okay, what's the next turn of the crank as far as education and, and teaching and, and propagating uh, to continue to have this movement uh, move forward? So I asked two questions um, over the course of October uh, 08 till about uh, March of this year. Tell me what's not working. Well, I surveyed approximately 100, you know, 200, or a little over 200 people on this, you know, leaders in the uh, software group organization. And they said, you know, and I wasn't quite surprised with what came out. It's like, well, poor planning, lack of vision, or things keep changing, we can't seem to hold tight to anything. Our processes, our legacy processes are absolutely killing us. There's no flexibility. We can't seem to modernize anything that's slowing down. And there's too much micromanagement or, or lack of ownership within the teams that the, the leaders were stepping in into the room. So the, they weren't feeling empowered. The other question that I asked is, what do you need from your leaders? And that came up with some very interesting things as well, which I don't think a lot of people would be surprised about. But you know. It was good to hear, see it on paper. Some of the things were trust. Peers trust each other, but they never trusted upper management. That was consistent. So I would talk to a second line manager team, and they say, "Oh yeah, I trust my peer. I trust so and so across the table." And then I would, I said, "Do you trust your manager?" Well, I kind of trust my, you know, everybody raise their hand. Say, so, mm, "Yeah," but above that, they didn't really have any trust. And then I would bring their their bosses in and ask the same question. They say at the peer level they're fine, but then they kind of go, well, do you trust your VP? Yeah, but how about your general manager? And not so much. So it's very consistent pattern, there's a very consistent pattern of trust. They also felt that they needed an open environment, to be able to share their ideas freely and not feel penalized, or feel like it was a very career, career limiting. So that was for over and over again. They begged. More, a more, you know, hands-off or stepping back approach. That you let me you know. I don't mind if you set the constraint. I don't mind if you set the budget. But let me figure out how to do my job. Don't tell me how to do my job as well. They wanted more communication. They felt when information was held back, it fostered the lack, uh, fostered the lack of trust and the lack of having an open environment. So we really are starting to think about how to over communicate and how to you know, foster that information sharing. Teams want to take more risks. They want their leaders to support them in taking the risks. And you know, if they fail, not to be completely relaxed about being able to learn. They want support from their senior executive teams. 
it's really, really important to them. And they need to be your public The other thing is they needed a clear vision and strategy. They, they wanted to be part of that as well because it's just too hard to explain to their engineers what it was and how, how to move forward and be able to construct the, the right project. And the last thing is just being empowered. Being empowered to make decisions. Being empowered based on the information they had to uh, self-correct or make course corrections throughout, throughout the project. So those are the top things that uh, the engineers wanted from their leaders. And this, like I said, it was very consistent as we went through the interviewing process off the line, nothing changed. Very, very consistent. So now we're at the point where we're involving the leadership role based on that criteria. And so some of the characteristics that I'm really trying to encourage, and we're starting to put a workshop together around this, around some critical things. Give and reinforce the leadership to the teams. Don't tell them how to do their jobs. Allow them to take ownership and to run with it. As a leader, we got we have to create this culture of trust. You know, make it safe for them. Make make it so that they feel that they can trust each other. Very critical. Making better decisions with less churn. I don't know how it is in some of uh, your enterprises, but we get a lot of plan change requests during the release cycle. Now, I I counted in the nine month release cycle for the uh, Webster Portal product, we had 600 plan changes. We spent more time arguing over plan changes than writing code. So there was just a lot of churn. And the reason why we were having that churn is because we didn't have good decision filters. We couldn't map back to the strategy. We weren't sure what the strategy was. So we argued and argued and argued over argue these plan changes. And uh, it just wasted a lot of team. It was very unproductive. As a leader, and I, I admit that I didn't, wasn't always the best at this, um, when should I step up? You know, what's the red, red flag my team is telling me to help to provide guidance without stifling the innovation that they're trying to do? And I'm a piece setter. I mean, we get classified by them you know, with different characteristics. So you know, I always like to get my hands dirty, help teams out, help them solve. Now I'm trying to take a different approach. When do I step in? When do I step back and just keep the focus there so that they can go and do their jobs? not telling them how to do the job. Another thing is just removing obstacles. We have a ton of obstacles at IBM. Um, just getting travel approval. Takes uh, five levels of approval. So how can I eliminate some of that, or how can I take that on and not get them distracted uh, working on getting travel approval requests? So just removing those barriers. And influencing versus being dictatorial or authoritative. How, especially in this role I have now, where I don't have 1,300 people working for me, I only have 50. How do I influence and inspire and motivate people to, the, you know, guide them to the right set of decisions versus telling them what the decision is, having them learn through their experiences. So we created this workshop really about collaborative leadership. And with help from the Excel and Nova Consulting Group, we started to put a workshop together. And we really feel that collaborative leadership will allow us to innovate, a little, a little, will allow us to deliver more value, have our teams be more productive. The key thing that we're teaching the leaders is that the answers are in your organization, and you really need to stand back and let them deliver. And we're teaching them how to do this with a set of tools. The other thing is, this is similar to what I did with just um, the Azure movement, is I'm creating taglines around brandiness. People can identify the brand. So we're coming up something that we're anchoring with the Smart Planet notion that um, is very strategic for IBM. Work smart, lead smart, collaborate. Allows you to innovate. Allows you to unleash talent. So we're starting to, to spread this out with a website to talk about how we're going to do this. So we've been at this now for about three months, and we're starting to see some success. And I'll just share with you some of the uh, few things that we've started to see. Leaders are very much now empowered to change things that are in their scope of influence. 
uh, it was an interesting like, uh, story when I was bringing this up to my manager. Um, he was just coming in to the organization and I was trying to give him a core dump line, you know, what I've been doing. And I showed him the results from uh, the surveys we were taking. And like, well, trust, open environment. He says, you can't fix that. I said, well, at the Galactic level, you can't. But what we need to do is tell or encourage people to fix what's in their scope. And people can feel more comfortable about that versus just saying, well, I don't know how to fix trust. And so people just back away and give up. So with the tools and with the techniques of collaborative leadership, we have started to see teams taking more control of what's in their control. And that's been very empowering to them. It's like, wow, OK, I understand that trust is pervasively an issue. But how do I fix trust within my team? How do I fix trust across teams or the teams that I have to work with? We're starting to see teams actually step up and do that. We're seeing lots of time saved on uh, doing planning because we're using decision-making tools and creating decision filters. The productivity of our teams, because of less churn, has gone up tremendously. Uh, that's been a, a great time saver for us. Building trust is another thing. Again, you know, how do you build it across teams, especially when we can't travel? Uh, my German team, they pride themselves on having face-to-face -face discussions because that's how they instantly build trust. So now we have very limited travel across the teams. So how do you now build the trust across the distributed teams? We gave that to them to problem solve. And they figured out how to use collaboration tools and technology to start to build that trust. Albeit if it happens a little more slowly, they're still starting to build the trust across those teams. We're starting to see teams now collaborate together in, some, in their silos to set goals and objectives Release. And, and that's really helped because then it, they can transform them into something that's meaningful to their engineering team. And that just makes it clear on what to focus on first. Focusing on the essentials. Focusing on what is really needed for that release. And we're starting to, to do more about asking questions and, and focusing the discovery through questions instead of just telling teams what to and as I said, this is hard for me to do. I mean, when you're very busy, the last thing you want to do is ask six questions when you know the answer. And so we've, we've started to pattern this and tried to teach teams how to go about doing this. And it's really been effective because then they learn, and they know they apply their experience, and they know the next time how to, how to solve this specific problem. So some experiences, so I'll, I'll just be wrapping up now. Using some of the decision-making tools, um, we have found that our, our planning cycles have been uh, reduced dramatically. We have a product, a, a transaction service called KISS. Their release cycles are every three years, but they're actually doing action when they're, they're chunking things up. Well, their planning for a release takes about three months. And they have to sift through, I think, anywhere about 10,000 requirements. They have gotten down their release planning cycle time from those three months down to three weeks because they now have better decision filters and understand what their customers need and have had discussions and dialogues on what's really important and what's essential. So that's one experience. The other experience was my own personal experience because I came into this organization and I knew just from my own experiences as a VP of development that our quality management system was broken. And I tried to have discussions with my peer, VP, who owned the process and said, Bob, you really need to get out there and talk to um, the VPs about this because they're just gagging over it. And they seem to, we seem to have an impasse because your quality execs think everything is wonderful, but when you talk to the development execs, they think it's a piece of crap. So I said, why don't we get together and try to hash this out? I said, it's fine, but you know, I really don't think there's anything wrong. Okay. So, we got in the tab. First, we started trading emails. And the emails were quiet at first. It's like, well, we really need to change the quality management template. You know, would you mind considering that? And then we, it just was silent off from the quality execs. So the, the emails started to escalate and were not as pleasant. So I said, okay, 
let's get in the room. Because somehow we have, we have to resolve this. This is just a polarized points of view here. And I, I was talking to Pollyanna. I said, look, I don't know how to resolve this because it's just, there's such an impasse. And every time we try to share facts, it doesn't become a fact-based discussion anymore. It becomes very emotional. She goes to me, she says, here's a sticky notes. I'm like, IBM execs are not going to want to use sticky notes. It's just, no, they like to argue, they like to consult each other, they don't like to collaborate. <laughs> just try it. I said, well, you're just pushing it, because that's what you're getting. She goes, no, try it. And so I said, so we got in the room, I wasn't going to do it. So I, I first said, okay, let's sit down, let's try to air our concerns. The, the quality exec sat on one side of the table, the dub exec sat on the other side. So this is going to be a problem. So I said, okay, who wants to, you know, who wants to throw out you know, some of the concerns they have? So one of the WPs stood up, leaned across the table and said, this stuff is crap. I'm like, whoa, okay, let's do sticky notes. Because <laughs> I didn't do this for yet. So we actually did the sticky notes. We said, what's working, what's not working? We grouped everything, you know, and we got five, five big issues that everyone who was in agreement had to be addressed. And we, we uh, actually signed those uh, work writers out, and we've actually made a big change. Now, granted, this took over a year to two. I mean, the sticky note session took four hours. But we all came to the table and had a, uh, a which is what was going to be very confrontational. We had a very unemotional, fact-based discussion and called out things that people didn't realize that were wrong. And so now we've made that transformation play and actually incorporated those changes into the process. And the team's going to be able with that. But the collaboration and the fact that we use these sticky notes in the military group entry really worked well to deal with confrontation. So the two main examples here is one, using collaboration to deal and remove conflict, and using the decision-making tools to help uh, speed up and create uh, appropriate decision filters so that they can prioritize and reform. So that's really helped out a lot. Important thoughts. I think this is, again, we're in a journey. And I think uh, the journey started with just trying to implement Agile. And implementing Agile with you know, tooling and best practices. We're now evolving off from that, because I think we've had success and we have sustainability, to looking at what's the role of a leader? How do you introduce more business value into the releases so you really improve that time of value? To do this, when we do this transformation shift to now saying what's this leaders, what does leaders look like in IBM, I have to partner up. Right now, you know, besides just creating the workshop materials on leadership, we're partnering with our corporate HR team to see how we can get it integrated into the basic learning um, and education for our, our managers and for our executives. And we're also working with our learning team to make this a formalized class. And we have something called IBM Values, and the IBM Values team um, to try and incorporate this. So we have a very consistent message on what leadership is in this new world. Um, and that, that's helping. So we're getting a lot of support across our IBM. This is just not now soft to do. So this is really a profound impact. And the other thing, with anything that's either new, potentially confrontational, you have to figure out how to get the support from your senior leaders. So that they give the right air cover, and they give provide the right safety nets to their teams to try to experiment, may fail, but to learn from those failures and to move forward. So that's that's the story of where we are right now. Um, it's been quite an exciting journey. And uh, when I first took the job, my boss said you failed the IQ test because I don't know how you have a chance for 26,000 people. But I really enjoyed where we've taken it, where you can really see that agile just doesn't apply to small teams, co-located teams, we've actually started to see Agile in the enterprise. So it's been quite exciting. I have to say that I've learned a lot from the conferences that I've attended and meeting people on how to apply this in the context of my meeting. So thank you, and I'll take a couple questions. What's your metric for productivity and why is it worth measuring? The metric for productivity can be a couple things. We look at um, 
in simple terms, and people will disagree with me, but you know, it's how many uh, user stories you can do within a integration. The um, another productivity tool is for starting a productivity metric is that we're coming our release cycles are getting shorter. So we've measured on average we're coming down from 18 months to more like 12 to nine month uh, release cycles. Um, and uh, so those are the two major ones uh, that we focus on. And then we're seeing that uh, our team sizes are getting smaller, our organizations are getting flatter. So we're redeploying those resources to work in white space. And so the, those are some of the productivity measures, the capacity measures that we're applying to, to measure uh, improvement. Yes, in the back. requirements versus parity requirements versus when you partner and who cares. And that has helped a lot, you know, again, with, um, aligning the purpose with the strategy and then use and then define those decision filters that align with what's what's important in the release. And, and they can go into more detail on that. I don't want to steal their blender. Yes? You run your business analyst uh, and yours through the same yeah, we're starting to. So the question was, do we have our business analysts go through this? We're starting to do this. It's going to be more on the leadership side because they make more of the business decisions. So we're taking it through that element versus agile. They tend to just be more part of the development teams, and they learn along the way. Um, we have we all offer our education to everybody, and but they don't typically you know go to those workshops. They tend to be more learning on the job. And they don't have any issues with that. But we will take them through this collaborative leadership uh, training too, so that I think it has more value for them. Yes? You mentioned for some of the executives who are nervous about risk, uh -huh. you offer them a quote unquote safety net. Yes. What, what kind of safety net were you able to offer them in terms of reducing their risk? Okay, so the question was for the execs, you know, they were a little nervous about this. And, how do they mitigate? How do we mitigate risk and provide safety net? Well, there were two ways of doing it. At first, I went to the exec and said, "Hey, you know, some of your teams are really excited about this. I don't want to get started. Um, I'll provide a coach for them. We'll put together uh, an approach and identify pain points within the project of what best practice is most suitable and most likely to uh, apply or can be applied to that project." So we're very uh, prescriptive and say, we did the analysis and uh, determined the readiness of the project to even adopt a best practice. So that was one thing. So teams just going off and trying to figure it themselves. We provide coaching. The other thing is that we took um, low risk products through Agile first to get the success. And so that was kind of the safety net there. So it's, there wasn't a lot of talk about the probability of failure. So that was the other way of doing it. So we didn't take our big gorilla projects um, that were a thousand people and that were 24 months of duration. We did not put those through first. Yes? What are you seeing as your sticking points inside your teams now? Uh, you mean like what obstacles? Yeah, what are you, what, you know, what are you running into with them now? Well, it's, it's still cultural. Oh yeah. Um, so what are some of the sticking points or obstacles that are still part of the transformation activities. I think uh, on the leadership front, uh, there's a real angst about, I'm asking, I'm telling leaders that their style is obsolete. We're, I'm not going in saying, hey, you know, you're a bad leader. We're saying, here's some things that you can do to improve your leadership capabilities. But still, they, they think that's great. <coughs> so that's the big thing I'm coming up against now, especially when I'm going to talk to my, my boss, who reports into the CEO. 
know, they're not going to want to hear that. So I have to come up with a different approach that's not threatening just to say, hey, your team's like this, just support them. We're not telling you to change. So that's one thing. The other thing is um, on just the, the whole agile transformation front is getting enough tools and consistency and the application of the best practices. But I mean, in the teams, what are their problems? It's, um, I'm not seeing it's it's, um, it's different for every team. You know, we had one team that tried to, to do agile and they didn't know what continuous integration was, and they didn't automate any test cases. So that was you know they were just a train wreck. There's other cases where they love the notion of no documentation. <laughs> so I had two teams. One did no did not document a defect. They didn't fix them either. <laughs> and so our integration 12, we were saying, well, I've got this huge backlog. I said, well, do you know how big the backlog is? No. We didn't document our defects. So they, the thing is, is with IBM, is, it's so big, everyone interprets things differently. So you always find different snags within the organization. So I just have these horror stories. And it's just amazing. Everything is different. And they argue, that's the other thing, they argue, it gets to the dog line. They argue, well, you're not agile. You're not agile enough. And they stop, stop. They don't have the right, it's unproductive. And, but they would go back and forth saying, well, this team, Sue, did you know this team is magic? <laughs> but they're doing something with that. That's all I want. And so when you get into these, these, these wars, and that's, that's where most of something, it's all up to the interpretation of the personality of the leader. Um, really kind of screws things up. Any other questions? Yes. Um, you had this slide with the uh, mandate, yeah. measure and motivate. Mm -hmm. You said focus on motivate. How do you help, how do you tell them to motivate their people? You have to give them tools. You have to give them. It has to be an open environment. They have to be able. To, uh, so the question is, how do you inspire, and motivate teams to change? And we really have to provide the scores, but I was there for them. I did round tips with them. Tell me what's working. It's very safe, create a very safe environment for them to learn and make mistakes and not be penalized for it. So that's that's most of it. What what did they specifically change so that people become motivated? When before they weren't motivated, now they are. Because they felt they had the uh, questions, well, what specifically changed? It was really just the feeling that it was an open environment. It was safe for them to experiment. And they weren't going to be penalized for that. That's all it's about. Really good. Is there one more question? Oh, sorry. What kind of problems have you had with inter product dependencies, especially with this not being APIs, not all you know, documented things again? Okay, so the question was what problems are, have I seen with interdependencies <coughs> between products? Well, this is not one of the this is one of the lessons learned. And I'm really I can't even put perfume on this page, it's so bad. <laughs> There are times when you start to combine our products, even two products. So if you combine our app server with our database, we counted the number of interdependencies. And we counted up to 256. Something huge. And that's not even talking about the API. That's just all the prereqs, the co-recs, the fixed tags, the iFixes that you had to do. On the API front, we really were not doing very well either because we were Teams were deprecating APIs and not telling people. And so we, you know, test cycles exploded because we didn't document. So we have an architecture board now in place that puts certain governance and guidelines in place around deprecating APIs, around what versions of Java to use, what versions of Eclipse to use, and trying to uh, mitigate or reduce the dependencies between the releases, uh, between the products. But this is a, a very, I, I don't have this on my title, um, but my real title is Development Transformation and Integration. So I'm have to deal with, you know, reducing the complexity of the prior information. Okay, uh, if there's no more questions, I really appreciate the time. Sorry for the technical difficulties.